start now. Okay. Okay, great. Um, by the way, do you have the link with the notes we took on uh, Wednesday? Yes, here, uh, I'll send it to the chat box. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's begin. So I will um, go through the code uh, following the basic flow to generate a proof for a block and the part uh, that begins um, is the interaction with get. And to get that, I will use an iteration test. So the difference between iteration tests and unique tests is that in integration test, we are using a get node running with blocks and we are querying uh, get via RPC methods. Uh, but in the unit test, we are not running a get node. Instead, we're using get as a library um, the uh, library calls to get, we are also creating blocks and um, running transactions on those blocks. But since we don't have the RPC API, some of the flow that is required to uh, prove a block is like simulated. That's why I will use an integration test because it has all the real steps. So first, and you can do this anytime if you want to inspect how the block is uh, proved in the real setup. So this first is, um, Starting a Docker container with get in the integration test, and then it will run some code that deploys contracts, uh, does some Ethereum transactions, calls the ERC20 an ERC20 contract, and does some ERC20 transfers, and so on. Okay. And meanwhile, I will start looking at the code, starting from the bus mapping. Okay, so in the bus mapping, we have a type which is called Builder client, which uh, contains the get object. And I, I would say this is one of uh, a good entry point to see the whole flow. And it has some methods that are the different steps that go over during the preparation of the all the inputs to the circuits. So here are the different steps, and they are called one after the other in the gen inputs method. And I added some prints here so that we can inspect what's going on. So let's start with the first one. So the first one is get block, and we pass it a block number. And we already see what we get from this, so we get the if block, get traces, history hashes, and the previous state root. So if we take a look at this function, get block, 
basically we have some methods that are wrappers over the RPC calls, which are just RPC methods that get has. So we have get block by number, given a, a number, we get the Ethereum block, which is a struct that contains all the information of a block. Then we have the trace, given a block number, which is an execution trace. So for um, every uh, transaction that executes code, uh, at every step we run some opcode and we get the list of opcodes that have been executed. So in this case, if the transaction is just uh, an ether transfer, we will not see any step in the trace because there is no opcode executed. Um, but there's still things going on. Then we fetch the last 256 blocks to get the previous block hashes. And, and the previous state root um, is obtained from uh, the previous block if there is some. So this is the first part, and now I will run. First, I will run a test which does an Ethereum transfer, an Ether transfer. So there will be no uh, EVM steps here on the trace. Okay. And I'm storing the logs in a file. Uh, and I'm going to do a trick here. So this is a log just uh, with print debugging from Rust. And I this. Uh, the Vim editor, and I set the syntax to JavaScript so it will add colors. So it looks nicer. So we can see uh, all the fields that, all the data that we have obtained from the first step. So we have the block with, with all the fields like hash, parent hash, the, the author address that uh, prepared this block, then root, gas, and so on. And the list of transactions with their signature, the data used. In this case, there is only one. And the block ends here. The next thing we have is the get traces. And as I said, this is an ether transfer. So there are no opcodes executed. So in this field struct logs, we would see the steps. So there are none. The history hashes, in this case, uh, the block that we have queried is, I think, the second block. So there is only one previous uh, block and the previous state root. By the way, if you have any question at any time, I think you can just interrupt me. Um, and I will try to answer that. OK. So the next step is get state accesses. So what, the, what this uh, function does is now we have a block. Basically, we have the block, the list of transactions, and the trace. In this case, the trace doesn't have any step. And we. To, in order to do the proof, we need to know for each account that is accessed during the proof, we need to know the state, uh, the in which state it was before the block was executed. And this is what this function does. So basically it goes um, through every transaction and 
I'll run this function. So basically, um, a transaction has a sender and a receiver. So those are where it may have a receiver or it may not. If it's a contract uh, creation transaction, it doesn't have a receiver. But if it does, those are two accounts that are accessed. So we add them. And then um, every step in the uh, trace may access some uh, account or storage. So here we have just a match that uh, takes care of all the outcodes that access the state and just records the what is accessed. So which address or in case of a storage, which address and storage key. So we store the, the keys of the accounts. So that's the address, but we don't store the content. We just uh, get the list of addresses and storage slots that are accessed. Uh, so this is the step two, and let's see how it looks. So this is it, access set. So we see that there are three accounts that are accessed and one code that is accessed. So um, I'm just guessing here, but probably these two are the sender and receiver, and the last one is the, the Coinbase, so the address that mined this block. And then we have the code, which will be the either the I guess the recipient. Um, I think maybe there is a false positive here because this is an if transfer. So probably when querying this quote this code, the so this address probably has no code, but it's still here. But I don't think this is a problem. Okay, so now we have the the set of addresses and storage and code hashes that are used. And now we go through the next step, which involves getting the values of these accounts. So we will get the nonce, um, the balance, the code uh, hash, and uh, uh, state uh, the storage root for each account. For each code hash, we will get the code. And for each storage key, we will get the storage value. And not only that, we will also get the proofs of each of these values. So actually, uh, get doesn't have an API to just get the state and storage values from the keys, you, you have an API to get the proof, uh, which is a Merkle proof. So that's the list of siblings from the root to the leaf that contains that value. But from that, we also get the, the value. And the proof will also be useful because it will be used uh, by the Merkle Patricia tree circuit, because uh, to prove all the transactions in the state and storage, we will need to build a partial Merkle tree and apply the updates there. And to build this, so the partial Merkle tree would be a Merkle tree that only contains the paths and the keys that are accessed or touched during a block. And we can build this from the proofs of all the access, all the accounts that are accessed. So this method get access, uh, sorry, get state, uh, just goes through this access set for all the addresses and keys, and just calls the uh, get RPC method to get the proof at the previous block. 
So with this, we get the account and storage values and proofs. And then for the code, uh, we query the address and we get the code. The code doesn't have a proof because um, to prove a code, we just need the code. We hash it and then this hash appears in the account value and for the account value we we'll already have the proof so um, that's how we prove a code okay so let's see how this looks like so uh, these are the storage proofs so we have queried this address which is either the sender or the receiver. And then we have uh, the value. So the value of an account is the RLP of the balance called hash, nonce, and storage hash. So here we already have these fields laid out. And the account proof is the list of siblings on the Merkle tree of the state tree from the root to the leaf that contains this account. And in this case, there was no uh, storage key in the query, so the storage proof is empty. And we continue with the proof of the, so we had the sender and also the receiver. Then we have the minor address. And that's all the storage proofs. And as uh, I thought before, uh, we queried the code of this address, but there is no code. So we just get empty. Uh, CC has a question. Yeah, so uh, like that's, that's like in EVM, do we need to check the receiver if they have code to uh determine like let's say if i accidentally send to a country it might like reject the the ether transfer so that's so um yeah we i think that's the reason why uh we query the code hash of the receiver because in case in case there is code we need it so before checking the steps we already add the code hash of the well where i had the receiver address as the code hash access set because we could uh, consider that no matter if there is code or not um, one step of the proof will be verifying that either there is code or there is no code so we need to prove that the code is empty or that there is code no matter what so we need to query this information i mean in this case there is no code and we could get that from the code hash because the code hash of the empty code is well known but we just have this uh innate information that doesn't hurt anyone does this answer the question okay Ah, uh, so we have seen the proofs and the codes that we retrieved. Then the next step is uh, basically from these proofs and codes, we um, extract uh, the keys and values. So the proofs contain the Merkle traits, but also the address and account fields and the uh, keys and storage values and the codes is also a map from code hash to code so we just build a memory uh, key value database um, that contains all the accounts uh, indexed by address all the storage uh, values indexed by key associated to each account and all the codes are indexed by code hash.
and we will use this database when processing the transactions and we will be updating this database so that we can reconstruct the intermediate states of these accounts so this function build state code db i think it's pretty simple so we have the state db and the code db which basically are hash maps and for every count and for every code we just insert them so let's see how this looks like so now we have uh, the accounts so for each address we have an account object and they have the empty storage we also have some extra information uh, that is initialized uh, empty and we would use this also to track um, some state that is unique to a block is the access list of accounts of storage uh dirty storage uh the structured account and refund i think for each block these are all init initialized to zero uh and they are uh used uh because at some eip uh there it was introduced a method to have different gas costs on the first time you access some data in the storage and the second time. So we track this here. And the code DB just has this address that doesn't have any code. And finally, this is the, the most uh, complex step, I would say, which takes mainly everything that we have gathered so far and generates, so this finally generates the inputs for the circuit. So we already have some inputs to the circuit. For instance, if we think about the bytecode circuit, the bytecode circuit uh, contains all the bytecode that is accessed during the processing of a block. And we already have the code db which contains all the contracts that were already deployed that will be accessed so that will be used to fill the bytecode there also will be more bytecodes that we will may find for instance of deploy new co new deployed contracts or they need code but some of the input to the bytecode here we already have it since we have this bytecode that will be hashed into the code hash it means that we also have inputs to the ketchup uh, circuit which verifies every ketchup um, uh, hash that is done during the processing of log and so on but this function mainly uh, prepares all the inputs to the evm circuit and the state circuit so let's see how it looks like. So first it creates a new block type. So previously we have been working with block types that correspond to the RPC methods from get. So they are the blocks that get returns. But here this uh, block type that we have defined, which has some extra information then we create a circuit input builder which is a struct that helps us keep track of uh, all the information that that we process from each uh, transaction and each step in the trace and uh, keeps track of extra data required to generate the inputs for the ABM circuit and uh, state circuit and then we have this main entry point of this uh, type which is handle block 
So handle block basically goes through every transaction in the block and calls this method handle transaction. And handle transaction uh, basically has some operations that are related to the beginning and the ending of a transaction. And then uh, for each uh, step on the trace, we have this uh, function, which is gen associated ops that uh, generates all the uh, circuit inputs for the step and also the state uh, circuit operations that are generated from the step. And we will look more in depth at this later. So now let's just see the object that we end up, how does it look like? So basically it's a mix of everything we had plus some extra information. So we have, we have moved the state DB here, which is the same as before. We have moved the code DB. Um, we have the block, which is which contains a lot of fields that we got from the Ethereum block that get returned. But then we also have some extra information. Um, these are the list of uh, operations that are uh, that will be tracked by the state circuit. So here there are two concepts of state that we use. One is the uh, persistent state, and that would be the state tree and the storage tree, and actually that's called state because it's called the state tree. So that would be, let's say the Ethereum state. So uh, that's what gets updated from one block to the other. But we could also think about the state during the execution of a block. So all the intermediary values that may persist or may not persist, for instance, uh, if we are in the middle of an execution and a contract is writing to memory, that memory will disappear after the transaction is processed. But during uh, the processing of the transactions, we can consider that the memory is part of the execution state. So that state that is uh, the that tracks that contains all the information that is uh, used during the processing of a block is what uh, we verify via the state circuit. And this container that we see here contains all these uh, state uh, operations uh, organized by what kind of um, area they apply to. So basically it's memory, stack. This will be uh, temporary. So after the transaction is completed, this will be reset. Let's have storage. This is not temporary. This uh, keeps uh, persistent unless there is a, a reversion. But in general, all the changes on the storage will persist after the transaction and after a block. We also have the access list, which are also temporary, and so on. Uh, and I think I will go through this later. So we have a bunch of operations that have happened during the processing of a block. And then we have the list of transactions, which contains some data that was uh, inherited from what we got from get. But we also have some 
extra information like every call that has happened with some details. And for every call, we have the steps. So if uh, you remember before, we saw uh, the execution trace of this um, transaction didn't contain any steps because there was no opcode executed. But here we see some steps. So the reason for this is that um, we verify transactions in the EVM circuit and the number of transactions is dynamic. The number of opcodes that gets executed in a step is dynamic. So, and there is some operations that happen uh, during the beginning of a transaction and the ending of a transaction. So for instance, a transaction contains some value that is transferred to the receiver and that implies a state, uh, an account operation that subtracts some value from an account and adds some value to another account. So we need to process this somewhere. So on the EVM circuit, apart from processing opcodes, we also uh, process these like virtual steps, which are not opcodes, but they are necessary uh, operations that happen during the processing of a transaction. And in this case, we see the begin transaction, which is a virtual step that we have uh, for every transaction that is uh, executed at the beginning. And we also have end transaction, which is a virtual step that will happen after uh, processing the, the opcodes of a transaction. And we have a list of useful information that will be required by the EVM circuit. And here we also have uh, the bus mapping instance, which is a list of references to operations. And these operations are references. So these references are for oper the operations that, operations that we saw before here. I call these operations like uh, transaction receive, um, call context, and so on. And this is related to how we split the uh, verification of the steps, execution steps themselves in the EVM circuit, and the verification of the state operations in the state circuit. And I will show a diagram of well, some helper uh, pictures of how this works later. So we saw we saw the begin transaction, and the other one is end transaction, which also has some uh, state operations. Um, then we have an extra uh, virtual step, which is end block. And in particular, uh, the when we set up the EVM circuit, it has a particular size, which means that it can hold uh, some steps. So we need to fill all the size of the EVM circuit with steps. But for instance, in this block, we only have one transaction which contains two steps. So there would be empty space. But in order to prove that we have processed everything, we need to fill the space of the circuit with uh, steps until the end. So we have the end block, which verifies some closing uh, processing of the block. And we use this uh, step uh, type as padding. And here we have um, a struct that contains how the end block or that will be used as padding until the, the last minus one step will look like and how the last end block will look like. And they are a bit different. Um, 
because uh, the operations that happen that are verified uh, in each step cannot be repeated. So we have like two kinds of end block, the not last and the last one. And here we also see some input data for other circuits that in this um, block uh, are not filled because they there was no such operations. Then we have the circuit parameters, which are the setup parameters of how we want to configure the circuits. And again, the Ethereum block with the data we retrieve from get. List of transactions. Uh, and some extra information. OK. So with this, we have concluded this part where we have seen uh, the flow of generating the inputs for all the circuits from uh, an Ethereum if transfer uh, transaction. So to better explain the relationship between the EVM circuit and the state circuit and all these operations that we saw, I have um some slides that i made uh i think two weeks ago for the hack exchange the ethereum hack exchange which is a call that happens every month where people present it's an internal ethereum call where people present the products they're working on Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. OK. Well, maybe before I go into that, um, these are complementary uh, diagrams that can be very useful on the architecture of the ZKVM circuit. So what we saw before was the code that generates the, the witness input for all the circuits that we see here. And as we saw more or less, everything is connected. So for instance, we discussed the briefly the bytecode circuit which contains the uh, bytecodes with their code hash but the bytecode that we uh, verify in the bytecode circuit is the bytecode that is used during the processing of a block so in the case we saw before it would be the bytecode of the receiver address of a transaction and the receiver address of the transaction is what the, the EVM processing does. And then the Ketchak circuit verifies this, the hash of this bytecode. So this is the bytecode used in a block. So everything comes from uh, data associated to the processing of a particular block. So to understand this diagram, I think the easiest part is to start from the bottom where we see the EVM circuit. Do you see my cursor? I uh, think very small, but ah, I very small. okay. It's so I will just okay, okay. So I will just say it aloud. So the EVM circuit will uh, verify all the 
steps of the execution of all transactions. And as we saw before, these steps are not only the steps that verify opcodes, but we also have some virtual steps that verify processing of stuff that is not opcodes, like the intrinsic processing of a transaction or the intrinsic processing of a block. Uh, then this, uh, during the processing of a transaction, there will be some operations that update the intermediate state of execution. And this will be handled by the state circuit via the read-write table. So in the read-write table, we have a lot of entries uh, of different types of operations, like updating memory, updating the stack, uh, updating the information of the car of all the call contexts that happen during the processing of the transaction and so on and this state uh, tracks the all the read and write operations to make sure they are consistent then when we are processing a transaction there in general we will have some uh, steps that are executed of uh, EVM opcodes. And every time we complete a step, uh, we'll jump to the next opcode. And the next opcode is a particular byte in the bytecode. So uh, we need to verify uh, that um, this opcode is indeed the one uh, in the byte code corresponding to the code hash of the execution that is happening. Uh, so for that, we have the bytecode circuit, which uh, indexes all the bytes of the bytecode by code hash. So we can query the byte at any position of the bytecode. And we can also query the length of a bytecode. Then uh, some operations of the EVM uh, require copying chunks of memory of dynamic size. For example, when we uh, retrieve the call data, uh, the size of the call data can have different sizes. And sometimes if it's uh, the, if we are in the call that happens right after a transaction, this call data will be in the transaction as a tran as a field of a transaction. Uh, if this call is uh, in a in a lower depth, so it's a call from uh, another call, the call data will be in memory. But in any case, we need uh, to copy this call data to memory from the instructions the opcodes that read call data. So uh, since this is a dynamic memory and the space for each step in the EVM circuit is limited, we needed a strategy that allows us to uh, copy a dynamic chunk of memory from one place to another with a step that has fixed size. Um, so we resolve this with the copy circuit, which uh, contains a dynamic number of steps depending on the size of the memory chunk, but allows the IBM circuit to keep a simple uh, step that is of a fixed size. And in particular, this copy circuit can copy from transaction uh, to memory, from bytecode to memory, for instance, when we do uh, a code copy, from memory to bytecode, when we do a uh, contract deployment. And I think that's more or less it. Then we have the transaction circuit, which on one hand uh, contains all the transactions, verifies their signatures, and in particular, 
more than saying verifies the transactions, what it does is uh, it takes the, so when we send a transaction to Ethereum, there is no sender address in the transaction. There is just a signature. And from the signature, we record the address. So what the transaction circuit does is uh, it, con it has the transaction, all the transaction fields the signature and an address, and it verifies that this address uh, corresponds to this transaction given, sorry, to this signature given this transaction hash. Uh, in the future, it will also calculate the transaction hash, and then it uh, offers all the transactions indexed by transaction ID uh, with all the, their fields for other circuits to query. And the way the circuits communicate is via lookup tables. But for now, we can think of it as just that, um, like we can think that every circuit would be like uh, performing some operations and other circuits can outsource some verification to those other circuits. So for instance, when the EVM circuit um, wants to uh, query a verified transaction instead of the EVM circuit doing the transaction verification, it queries the transaction circuit and then it guarantees that someone else has verified this transaction. Uh, what else was have the block circuit, which verifies the block hash and exposes the block fields for the EVM circuit to query we have we we don't have it yet but we will have in the future an rlp circuit which helps uh serializing uh transactions and blocks into bytes using the rlp encoding then we also have the mpt circuit which uh verifies uh reads and writes of the state and storage trees with the corresponding uh, Markov tree proofs. So these are either proving that a particular address has some nonce or balance or code hash, or proving that an update to an account is correct, and the same for the uh, storage tree. Then we have the Ketchak circuit, which uh, verifies all the get checks that are you are done during the processing of a block. And there are many places where we have get checks. So for instance, the Merkle Patricia tree um, uses get check to as part of the MPT uh, data structure where every node of the MPT is hashed um, is hashed and then passed to the higher level node to calculate at the end the final state uh, or well, the tree root. The bytecode circuit uses the Ketchak to calculate the code hash associated to its bytecode. The EVM circuit uh, requires the Ketchak for the SHA3 opcode. And the transaction circuit records the Ketchak to calculate the transaction hash, which is required for two things. One uh, is to calculate the, to record the address from the signature. And the other is for the, the transaction tree that will appear in the block. And finally, the block circuit uses the Ketchak to calculate the block hash. And then the remaining circuit is the public input circuit. Uh, so the reason to have this circuit is that there is a cost associated with every uh, real public input that we have in a proof. So the public inputs in a proof are filled uh, elements that 
the verifier needs to operate with during the verification of a proof. And if we have more of these values, the proof is more expensive. So uh, it's convenient to design a mechanism where if we have lots of data that we want, lots of data that the verifier can see that we want to pass to the circuit, instead of uh, adding many values as public inputs, we somehow compress them. And what we currently, we have uh, a shortcut implementation, but on the short midterm, what we plan to do is to take all these values, hash them, and then we will get one or two uh, values. The reason why it would be two instead of one is that this hash uh, would be SHA-3, so that's 256 bits. And we do SHA-3 because we want this to be efficiently computed on L1. And there is the SHA-3 opcode. Uh, so again, this was 256 bits, but the fields that we work with they are 253 bits. So we're going to split this into two. Uh, we will pass this as public input to the circuit. And then we will have this public input circuit that will verify the hash of this value by laying out all the, the data that was used in the hash. So from this hash, we will recover all the transaction fields, all the block header fields, and so on. And this can be used then by the other circuits. Um, yeah, and now a detail about the communication of the circuits is that the way we, the circuits talk to each other is via lookup tables. So we can think about it as seeing that every circuit, or most of the circuits will have an associated uh, table. And um, the cir this table will contain a list of inputs and outputs of some operation. And the circuit will be in charge of verifying that this operation is correct. So for example, on the Ketchak circuit, the input would be a list of bytes, and the output would be the hash of this list of bytes. And the circuit will verify that this is correct, so that the hash is done correctly. And then this table of inputs and outputs is exposed, exposed so that other circuits can query an input output. And if it appears in the table, it means that the circuit is a, the, this external circuit is able to verify that, oper that that operation is correct. And that's how we use uh, the lookup tables. And then, so this diagram has uh, the legend says that all the squares are circuits. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, this depends on what we define by circuit. So in the current implementation, see these circuits would be subcomponents of a single big circuit. So it's not like we have a proof for each of these circuits. Instead, they we can think of it as taking all these uh, subcircuits and concatenating them together into a big a single circuit, which we call the super circuit. And from that, we generate a single proof. But in the future, this may change. So it's possible that some of these circuits will belong to different proofs. And then we will have uh, lookups going on between different proofs. But for now, this is the situation. OK. And now I will explain the, 
the idea behind the the EVM circuit and state circuit, but I will explain it in a simplified manner. So instead of talking about the EVM, I will talk about the general VM. And instead of thinking about the state circuit, which has a, a lot uh, of different kinds of uh, operations, I will consider only memory that has an address. So the memory address and the value that it contains. So uh, we have that the, the main component of, uh, of the circuit component of a ZKVM would be a circuit that verifies the execution trace, which is the, the list of opcodes that have been executed in a particular run. And uh, basically, this is a list of steps. And at each step, we are running one particular opcode. So in general, we will have uh, some uh, gates associated with each opcode. And at the particular step, only the gates associated with that opcode are active. The rest are inactive. And these gates, uh, they operate on, we can think of local data. So for instance, if there is an addition, it just concerns that the output of the addition is correct even the input of the addition. Uh, and if there is a, a multiplication, the same. Um, but it doesn't concern on where this input comes from. And where this input and output come from and goes to is usually to memory. So we have a situation where we can have uh, an operation or a step that creates memory location A, but this memory location A must be the same value that was written to this location before. And this before can be the previous step or 10 steps before or 100 steps before. So there is uh, no known offset between this write and the later read on the same location, on the same memory location. But to prove that the, the trace is correct, we need to guarantee that every time we read a memory location A, the value that we use is the same of the previous write, which we don't know where it was. And uh, we have constraints when defining um, the gates in Halo 2 and in other uh, ZK languages, which is that in general, we can only do either um, local accesses to signals. So for instance, in Halo 2, we have the rotations and we can access maybe the next uh, row, that, that next tenth row and so on. But there is also, there is always this uh, offset from where we start that we have to fix, although it can be, um, so if we find the next row, it means that we can uh, cover all the rows at the next offset. So that's one way, which would be like uh, uh, this, finding something that is local to where you are evaluating the gate at a short distance. And the other option is using copy constraints, which requires fixed offsets. So instead of having these relative offsets from the gate, we have absolute offsets at some places on the circuit where we can uh, verify that this value at this offset and this other value at this offset are the same. But here we have a situation where the relative offset doesn't work because we don't know 
the offset and the absolute offset also doesn't work because it can happen anywhere. So we need a way to solve this. <coughs> so this is how we do it. So on the left, we see the execution trace, which first, in this case, we see three steps. This would be all witness data. And in this case, we have two additions and one multiplication. And then we also have all the memory operations that are associated with each uh, step. So for instance, uh, maybe we're doing an addition and the inputs are the value at address zero and one and the output is the value at address two. Then we have another addition which takes different addresses for input and a new address for output. And finally, we have a multiplication which takes the first input is the output of the first addition. The second input is the output of the second addition. And the output is, uh, we're reusing one of the inputs of the first addition. Um, so we have, uh, in this trace recorded all these uh, memory accesses and we have added a timestamp to them. Um, so since uh, we have all the uh, steps in chronological order here, we can put all the memory accesses uh, with a timestamp. And this circuit can guarantee that this timestamp must increase sequentially by one at each uh, row. But as you can see, um, when we are at the multiplication step and we do the first read at address two, we should read the value 11 because that's what was written in the output of the first addition. But you can see that the offset between the write and the read at address two is, is four, uh, it jumps four rows. But then we see that the, the second uh, read of the multiplication at address five uh, reads a value that was written uh, two rows ago. So this offset is completely dynamic and cannot be predicted and it will change uh, with the uh, code that we run. So from this, we cannot guarantee the memory consistency. So that's why we introduce another, uh, let's say, circuit that contains a trace of uh, all the memory accesses. But here, instead of being sorted by uh, timestamp like it is on the left, they are sorted by address first, and after uh, sort the after the address, they are sorted by timestamp. So what we get from this is that we start with all the access that have ever happened at address zero, then all the access that have happened at address one, then all the accesses that have happened at address two, and so on. And then within these chunks that are uh, or grouped by address they are uh, sorted chrono now chronologically. Um, so the interesting here thing here is that if we have uh, this sorting order, now every time we have a read of uh, a, a, at an address, the previous write or the previous value will be at a fixed relative offset. So that is just the row before. So for instance, if we take the second row, this is a, uh, no, forget about the second row. We take the, the fifth row, which is the address to timestamp seven, and we have a read. So this is a read to have memory consistency. We must make sure that the previous uh, write, or in general, the previous value that we had at address two was also 11. And since we have sorted it this way, we just have this in the previous row. So if we have a read and the previous row is still on the same address, the value must be the same. 
And this is an easy uh, constraint to add because it does, it uses uh, relative offset. And we can just do this for uh, verification for all the rows. So what this circuit does is two things. One, it verifies that all these entries are sorted by address and then timestamp. And then it verifies that if there is a read uh, and before this read, there was another entry at the same address, the value must be the same. This guarantees uh, the memory consistency. So every read contains the same value as the previous write. And then on the, this is what we have on the right. On the left, we only have the guarantee that each uh, memory access um, contains the correct timestamp uh, on chronological order, and that for every opcode, uh, the output has some relations with the input. So this is the the local verification that that we can do. Finally, uh, we do a permutation check between these two tables. So these are the all the entries of uh, uh, memory uh, operation on the left and on the right. And if one of these tables is the permutation of the other, it means that all the entries that are on the left appear on the right. And if that's the case, we finally get what we wanted, which is that all the operations uh, are, so all the output operations of each opcode are correct, and the memory is consistent, be consistent between reads and writes. Um, is there any question on that? Oh, there is a question by Adria. Uh, yes. Uh, so this permutation check uh, is something that should be like uh, specially designed for a ship within the verifier or something like this, because I don't know if Halo 2 has this kind of big permutation checks. So. Yeah, so I think that Halo 2 doesn't offer permutation checks on the API. So instead of doing a permutation check, what we do is, well, we do it via lookups. So for every entry on the left, we are doing a lookup to make sure that it appears on the right. And the next part is making sure that all the timestamps on the left are unique and uh, the there are some other properties that we check. So via lookups and some extra checks, we end up with the same uh, thing as a permutation check, but we don't do a permutation check explicitly. Other question? Yeah. Uh, oh, but would that mean, so it, uh, for all the table, Oh, for all the entries on the left, we do the lookup to the right side. But yes. wouldn't that mean the right side of table could be larger than the left side? So like larger. So let's say in terms of uh, used rows or in terms of absolute number of rows? Uh absolute uh I mean, like, for example, for, for every entry on the left side, we can find it on the, uh, the right side, the rewrite trace. Mm -hmm. uh, can people, like, insert a new entry on the right side that is not in the left side? Right. So on one hand, we have that currently uh, these two subcomponents live on the same circuit. So we can guarantee that they have the same uh, size, right? So they have the same number of rows, but of course we have the concept of padding. So you could say that one, one table has more effective rows than the other. 
So for this particular case, one way to fix this issue is to make sure that all the entries on the left contain contain a timestamp, for instance. And then uh, it is guaranteed that all the timestamps are different on the left and they are from the first row to the last row. Then we um, do a lookup for all the entries, no matter what. So there is, even if they are padding, we still do a lookup. Then if uh, this succeeds, it means that there, and there is this of uh, height n, it means that on the right side, right side hand, there must be n unique uh, entries because all the timestamps are different. And if there are n unique entries on the right and they all come from lookups on the left, it means that there th this is a permutation. Does this make sense? Makes sense. Yeah, but that, that's a good point. Um, just by doing lookups, we cannot guarantee that this is a permutation and we could have uh, extra entries on the right. So we need something extra to first make sure. So first we make sure with lookups that whatever is on the left appears on the right. And then we need to make sure that there is nothing on the right that doesn't appear on the left. Uh, sorry, one more question. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, for example, the uh, address two on the right table, we jump on timestamp three to seven. And yes. is there a limit, like how far you can jump? Uh, no. No. So, like, let's say I jump a really big number and, like, it happens to be negative one in the, the final field. And, then ah, okay. Yeah, so th th there is some checks here. So for instance, we, for instance, if we say that we have um, n rows and this is two to the 32, then we can constrain the timestamp to be 32 bits. And since it's sequential starting from one, we know that we will not exhaust it. So we will not overflow. And then we do range check on the timestamp to be 32 bits, and that avoids this issue. Oh, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. But we can do this because the timestamp starts at one and only increases sequentially. Uh, for other things, we cannot do this because uh, there could be like higher jumps than just one, 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 one. Okay, how do we have until 11? Or how much longer do we have? Sorry, how much more time do we have? Uh, we have uh, 40 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I will go back now to the code and try to see how these uh random access memory thing uh applies to the circuits Yeah, maybe before I do switching the monitor, like, uh, do we have question like, uh, for on the part before? Uh, no. Okay. So
So let's see um, how the memory circuit that we saw uh, relates to the state circuit. Um, maybe we can start by looking back at what we printed. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in the slide, we saw that we have this memory circuit that contains all the memory accesses, and they are no longer sorted by chronological order. Instead, they are sorted by the memory address they apply to and then chronologically. So in our case, um, we have instead of a memory circuit, we have the state circuit. And this state circuit um, not only contains memory, uh, which is a thing in the EBM execution. So um, whenever we are executing EBM code, there is a concept of memory that we can read and write to. Um, but this memory is uh, particular to a call context. So when we start in a transaction, we have some memory. At some point, uh, we can have a call to another contract. And this call has another uh, memory scope. So the address of the first call uh, context zero is different than the address of the second call context zero. So um, that is one thing. So we will have multiple, let's say, memories at the same time. But we also have other things that we track, like the stack, uh, uh, the storage. So this is uh, just a trace of all the accounts that we read and write for that block and keys, storage keys. We also have the, the access lists. Um, what else? The call context. So the co in call context, we store information about uh, the call that we are in currently, so that when we do a call, another call, and then we return, we can recover the state. So for instance, uh, we are executing some uh, contract, and we are a at a particular program counter, and then we call to another contract. Now the program counter goes back to zero uh, for another, let's say, another program. But at some point, we return. We need to go back to the previous program counter of the previous call. So we need to store all the information. Uh, yeah, so uh, in the end, instead of just having the memory uh, indexed by address, we have uh, this, let's call them instead of memory, we call them operations. And these operations have a tag, which is whether they are memory, stack, storage, and so on. And instead of having a memory address, they have a key which can have several components. So for instance, for memory, we would have the tag memory, um, the, the call ID, and then the address of the memory. For stack, we would have the stack tag, the call ID, and the stack index, and so on. But we could consider that this all this list of values that uh, index one particular uh, piece of data uh, would be similar to the address, the memory address that we saw on the slides. Um, so one thing that the circuit input builder does is go through every uh, execution step 
no matter if it's an opcode or a virtual step like begin transaction and end transaction, and collect all the uh, state operations that the, that step will do. And these are later collected in this uh, container that we see here. So this will uh, hold all the operation, the state operations that are done through the processing of the whole block. And this will be the input to the state circuit. So this would be the list of values uh, that we saw on the right on the slide. And even though they are appear now uh, in a struct form, um, at the end, we just put them in a table format. So depending on the tag, um, we have different names. But at the end, they are all uh, mixed together so that, for instance, uh, the column that holds the memory address is the same as the column that holds the stack index for the stack. And there is a, a difference in naming. So in the slides, we saw a timestamp, which started at 1 and increased by 1 uh, with each access. In the ZKBM, instead of using timestamp, we use the read write counter. Uh, so um, they are like the same concept. The read write counter starts at 1 on the first uh, step on the EVM circuit. And then for every operation that is done, it increases by 1. And we have some constraints for associated to each execution state, which uh, verify that the read-write counter increase from that step to the next is correct. And this guarantees that um, we keep increasing the read-write counter by one every time, and we never skip any uh, value. So this would be the contents that will appear in the state circuit. So that's, again, the, the table we saw on the right, the memory trace. And this would be the execution steps that are part of the execution trace. So these are the steps sorted chronologically, this would be uh, the same as the table on the left. And uh, here would be all the read-write operations that are performed by this uh, step sorted chronologically. So as we can see, for instance, this is the begin transaction step. It performs four uh, operations on call context. And um, we store here just an index to the container we saw before to avoid redundant data. But here, the, the, the circuit will just have the values of uh, the operation that we saw from the container before that will match the values on the state circuit with the same data. And here we also have the execution step, which has uh, also uh, some operations. Here they are sorted chronologically. And then in the state circuit, they will be reordered by, by tag, address, or keys in general. And finally, read write counter. So, the, the begin transaction and end transaction are maybe uh, quite complex. So what I will do now is uh, execute a test which performs uh, an ERC-20 transfer. 
So this one will call a contract and and run some code to perform a near C20 transfer. And then we will observe the same checks as before. Okay, so the beginning will be very similar. We also have a block in this case. So I think before we had block two, this is block seven. So we'll have a transaction. Uh, um, yeah, so now when we see the history hashes, we will see more uh, previous blocks. So there should be six, seven here. Um, because before we had block two, and now we have block seven. This is just a particular setting of this integration test. But now let's see the interesting part that has changed here. So before, on the guest trace, we didn't have any step because it was just a transaction that uh, transferred ETH but didn't execute any code. But now we have uh, many steps. So this is what we get exactly from get. So we have for each step, we have the program counter which indicates the index in the bytecode that contains the opcode that we're executing, the name of the opcode, the gas that remains in this transaction, the gas cost of this uh, executing this opcode, the depth, this is the call depth. So every time we do a call in the in a, in a, an execution, we increase the depth. So we go to a new call context and the depth increases and there is a limit. Uh, the error uh, here, get will report a message for some errors, not for all of them. So sometimes it is useful, but some of them are not reported. So we have to, ha we have to deal with this manually. The stack uh, contains the, a snapshot of the stack at this call context at this step. And then the storage contains um, the storage that ch uh, changes in this execution. So for instance, uh, oh, and the stack here, I think it's the stack before this step is uh, finalized. So before it started. So here the first opcode is push one. So this opcode uh, looks up the next byte. So the zero index contains the opcode push and uh, index one contains a byte that will be pushed to the stack. So now we can see the next step has from counter those. It has skipped one because it contains the byte that is pushed to the stack. And now we can see that the pushed byte was uh, 0x80. So we have a list of steps, and each step is a particular opcode. And we have many, many steps here. Okay. So now let's see. Um, What else has changed? Um, so this is an ERC20 uh, contract and the tokens uh, balances are stored in the contract as the 
in the storage uh, tree of the contract. So if we now see the access set, we can see that this account has touched um, two keys of the, the storage tree. And I'm guessing that one will be the slot that holds the sender balance and the other the slot that's, that stores the receiver balance because we have done a transfer from a sender to a receiver. We have the storage pros that we can skip. And now we have, this is the address that holds the ERC20 contract. So now it's not empty, it has some data. And in the state DB, we can see now that the storage has two keys. And this is the storage uh, before the block. So I'm guessing this is the sender, which has some balance. And this is the receiver, which has zero balance. And after the block, uh, the sender will have some, will have less balance and the receiver will have a positive balance. Again, the code DB. Okay. And now we have the result of uh generating all the circuit inputs again the code tv and yeah so let's jump to the steps okay yeah i'm skipping the first one so now let's see so we have uh, after the begin transaction, we have uh, an execution step, which is the push one. So there is one detail. So before I mentioned that um, in the EVM circuit, we have steps for things that uh, are not steps in the guest trace and we can call them virtual steps. And this is because there are some intrinsic operations that process data, but they are not run the opcodes, like uh, doing a transaction already uh, moves some balance from one account to the other. So for that, we have the begin transaction, end transaction, and end block. And then we also have uh, states that relate to opcodes but uh, there is, so at the end, uh, on the circuit design side, uh, there is like a, like a switch statement that depending on the opcode, it activates some gates or the other. And having more entries in this switch has a cost on the circuit side. So sometimes we merge different opcodes into the same case. And for instance, we can see this in the push. So there are 32 different, well, 31 different uh, pushes. 31. 32 different push operations uh, on the EVM. But instead of having 32 uh, gates of the circuit for each one, we have uh, a single case that internally handles every possible push. And we do this trick in other places. For instance, the addition and the subtraction can use the same verifying logic just by swapping the order of the values. So you can say that A plus B equals C or C minus B equals a they are equivalent and so an addition and a subtraction is just the same but uh moving around the the values so we do this for uh we mix addition and subtraction we also i think we mix multiplication and division and stuff like that so let's see what we have here that is new now we we can understand what the read write counter is 
So this is the read write counter at the beginning of this step. So this means that uh, the previous uh, step, which was the begin transaction, has performed 23 uh, read write operations. And now we see the operations that this uh, step uh, generates. So this is a push. So the only thing that does that affects the state of execution uh, is pushing a value to the stack. So we have a single operation. So let's see if we can find it in this. In the list of operations. So memory, let's find stack. OK. So we saw that the read, read write counter here was, was 23. Um, this means in particular that the next operation that will be performed will use the 23. So this should be 23. And here on the right, we see that there is a stack operation which has read write counter 23. It's a write, which matches the fact that this is a push. And uh, this is a stack operation on the call ID one. So remember, we can have different depth, depths of calls. So for each call context, we'll have its own stack. So we need to uh, keep the call ID as part of the keys to store this data so that we don't overwrite a stack of a different call context. We have the address. So in this case, we uh, store the stack starting from address uh, 1023. And then we go to lower addresses until 0. And then the value, which is uh, the value that is written to the stack, which is 0x80, uh, which matches what we saw before. Uh, so maybe now I will show the code of the bus mapping for the push one. And we should be able to see all this. Um, but I will go there through this function that we saw before that generates the inputs. So we had this uh, last uh, step, which was generate inputs from state. And uh, we saw that this is what creates the circuit input builder and calls the handle block. And this is where all the inputs to the ABM circuit and state circuit are generated. So let's see this one. Uh, this iterates over all transactions. In our case, we have a single transaction. Uh, first, it generates the it processes the virtual step of begin transaction here. And then it goes through the trace for, and for each step. It calls the gen associated ops for each step. And as we remember, the first step, uh, the first op call that is executed in this contract is the push one, which is what we saw. So let's see how this function works. Uh, OK, so uh, there is some extra code here, which is uh, whenever we have an error in the execution. And an error, I don't mean that there is a failure. So the EBM is a virtual machine that contains like exception situations and they are defined it's defined what should happen in those situations and whenever we have such a situation we need to prove that uh, something is going to cause an exception and that the context for that uh, exception is happening 
So for that, we have uh, special execution states that relate to this uh, exception or error states. So uh, here, before we process an opcode that would be successful, we check if the step is an error. But for now, I will skip this. OK. So finally, we have this, um, this method that takes an opcode and has a big match. And basically, we have for every possible opcode, we have some uh, function associated that processes that opcode and generates all the, the list of operations that this opcode will require on the read, like the list of read write operations. So let's find push one. Mm, let's see. Where is push? Oh, it's the one. Yeah. Oh, what yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, so a summary of why this is like this, I guess there are um 32 push opcodes uh, that each one takes a different number of bytes to push to the stack and having it in a match with like this and so one would be very long so we have just this quick check um which uh, in a different way, make sure that if this is a push or not. And now we have um, a single function that is implemented on this uh, struct. This is uh, just a way to organize things. And as I said, we merge some opcode verifications in a single execution state, and the push is one of those cases. And in, moreover, um, we have a lot, a lot of opcodes that when we see them uh, in relation to the read-write operations that they perform on the state of execution, they are very similar. So we have uh, this stack only opcode, which basically can be defined as an opcode that only accesses the stack. And these are the number of uh, pops and the number of pushes. So let's see how this goes. So in this case, it was zero pops and one push. These are the two associated constants of this struct. So this will not be executed, and this will be one, and we just perform a stack write. So here we have uh, an object which contains a, a reference to the input circuit state, which has everything that we need to process uh, these steps. And whenever we call stack write, this will uh, store a new entry in the container we saw before. So that's going to be the thing on the right. It's going to generate this element into uh, this uh, stack container. And uh, from the trace, we get the stack uh, index and the value. Um, so this is the bus mapping side. Maybe now we can look at the circuit side.
Okay, so uh, we have the push gadget that is, uh, so in the circuit, we have uh, gadgets which are um, an abstraction used uh, for writing circuits, which we can think of them as a collection of constraints that can be activated. And uh, in this case, for all the push opcodes, the 32 op push opcodes, we have a single uh, gadget that handles them all. And since there's, go I mean, since there are more than one opcode that is handled by this gadget, some of the logic of this gadget would be about checking which opcode in particular is uh, um, is this case and then uh, selecting some constraints or others depending on the on the opcode. So in this case, um, this gadget performs two things. Uh, it has to remember this uh, push operation, read some bytes from the bytecode that are after the opcode itself, so at the program counter plus one, plus two, plus three, depending on the value of the push. And then these values that are read from the bytecode are uh, collected into a single value and written to the stack. Um, so we have here the first uh, operation, which is doing the lookup to the bytecode. And if you remember the diagram before, we saw that the EVM circuit does lookups to the bytecode table. This is what uh, this operation does. And the result is uh, held in byte. And I think what this does, yeah, this first part, I think it just reads the bytes depending on the push uh, size it reads one or more bytes and combines them all into a value and we can skip for now and let me see the push yes so finally here is the push of this value that we have uh, read so this push is, in this case, uh, what will use the read-write counter 23 that we saw before. And then there is some extra stuff. So this is a, I mean, I don't want to go into much detail, but this is how uh, the, the circuit uses the data that has been generated by the, the circuit input builder on the uh, constraint side. So these are constraints that will uh, use the same shape. So as we saw, it's a single stack write. This is the only uh, execution state operation. We also saw some uh, byte code uh, reads, uh, which are not handled via the state circuit. So uh, they don't have a regret counter and they are not tracked the same way. And here we have the uh, assignment. So for each gadget, we need some code that assigns the value. So this um, um, circuit will be similar to what we saw on the slides where we had add, add, and mul. So in this case, we had we would have one that is push, and this push will have uh this single read write operation which is a stack write and it needs uh to be assigned some values for uh so in particular the stack push will need to know all the values so that's the stack index and so on and the value which was in this case it was 0x80 so uh in the assignment for this gadget we are receiving uh, a block transaction called an execution step. 
and these three pieces are uh, exact are very similar there is a small conversion of types but they contain the same contents of the output that was generated from the circuit input builder and we pass everything in case the opcode needs it but in this case as you can see we are not using the transaction or the call just the execution step but this execution step would be uh, this one so this is what we have uh, as input for this assignment method and in particular we can see how this is used in here so here we have the read write indices uh, which corresponds to this part and we just have a single entry which is the stack uh, write so here we query the first entry and remember that in the step we only have a reference we don't have the value itself the value itself is on the right uh, and this is uh, stored in the block so that's why we do block uh, read writes and then uh, we use this reference to access the particular value and from this we just are recovering the stack value which was the value written to the stack and now we have this gadget has a value signal that must contain this value so we just assign it and there's some extra stuff um yeah so this is a very quick overview uh and there's like one or two minutes left uh is there any question or comments I can also stop the recording to to like ask questions if that makes you more comfortable. Uh, okay, let me see. Yeah. Uh,